Hello, sports fans! Welcome to the Broadcast Booth. I'm Jason Aaron Goldberg, and this is Car Collecting Shenanigans. While you're here, hope you'll subscribe. We've got something special today. Alongside me in the booth is the verifier, Alan Goldberg. Say hello to the folks at home. Hello, folks at home. He's not the best co-host on YouTube for nothing, folks. Strap in, because we're about to embark on the great Gaudi reveal. The Verifier is a treasure trove of baseball history, and he's here to share some of that knowledge as we go through the cards. But first, why don't you tell the folks how we made this discovery? I ran into an old fraternity brother while I was out walking my dog in the park. I told him about shenanigans, and he said he had boxes of cards in his garage and wanted to know if there was anything of value. It was roughly three boxes of junk era cards. You know, all the same stuff every kid your age was collecting back then. But as I took a quick glance, I saw there was this stack of really old cards. And here we are. Here we are indeed. As we go through these, I'll talk a little bit about the raw and slabbed value based on recent eBay sold listing. And the verifier is going to chime in with some historical fun facts. So we're not going to waste any time. We are coming out super hot. First up, the card of the lot. Ka-boom. The Bambino. 1933 Gaudi Babe Ruth. One of multiple cards he has in the set. Uh, Pop count on this, 943 graded cards. Only one in the world is graded at 10. Raw price sells for anywhere between two to $500. Uh, and graded... Grades 1 to 3, about $2,500 to $8,000. 4 to 6, anywhere from $8,500 to $10,000. Now this, I mean, if we were able to discover this in our own garage, I'd probably lose my mind. I'm going to try to see if we can buy this uh, raw, but I don't know if we can afford it. Like I said, I didn't want to waste any time. We wanted to come out hot with the card of the lot, but there are multiple Hall of Famers in here. So we're going to set the Bambino next to the Bambino. Keep him back there for to watch the show along with everybody. All right. And uh, next up, please excuse a little paper rustling. We have notes. We have little interesting things uh, so we don't miss out. Next up, Jim Bottomley, 1933 Gowdy. Uh, raw price, 50 to 60 bucks. Graded 1 to 3. Uh, anywhere from 60 to 100, 4 to 6, 175 to 250 dollars. Bottomley was a two-time World Series champion and the 1928 NL MVP. He was elected into the Hall of Fame by the Veterans Committee in 1974. The committee accused him of cronyism because he had teammates and pals on the committee that elected him caused Vet Committee to have the reduced power that elected in the future. Hold, holds record for most unassisted double plays by a first baseman with eight. You would think more guys would have achieved more than eight unassisted uh, double plays, but uh, no, I guess he's still the man. Another Hall of Famer. All right, next up, the guy I mentioned a lot recently, Joe Cronin, who... On January 26th, it was the anniversary of his election to the Hall of Fame alongside the great Hank Greenberg. I really like this card because the blue pops like crazy. Um, so the raw price on this, again, not crazy, $40 to $60. Graded in a 1 to 3, anywhere 50 to 100, 4 to 6, 250 to 500. But one sold last October in a 7 for $693.88. Cronin was a seven-time All-Star, elected to the Hall of Fame in 1956. His number four was retired by the Boston Red Sox. He managed the Red. He was the GM for the Red Sox for 11 years, and then he became the AL president for 15 years. The guy knew baseball. Look at the color on this thing. When we're, you know, as we go through, we made this discovery. And usually you're going to have a lot of rounded corners. As we get closer uh, to the end of over 30 cards we're going to show here, um, you can see some not in great conditions. But when you look at this, the centering, the color, just an outstanding looking card for the age. Uh, next up, 
Leon Goose Gosselin. Now, you told me that was actually where Goose Gossage got his nickname. That's right. And got Goose Gossage hated the name Goose. <laughs> uh, so this card, again, raw, 60 to 80 bucks, uh, graded at a 2, sold for $86, a 5 for $255, and a 6 for $384. Those are all sales from last year. Gosselin was a two-time World Series champion and elected to the Hall of Fame by the Veterans Committee in 1968. Again, really, really good centering. I don't know if this one has fading or if that's just a very light green color, um, but still very, very good condition. I'm blown away by the condition of these. I guess that's what happens when you just leave cards in the garage for 100 years. Uh, all right, next up, Henry... Heine, I'm guessing, is, is was the nickname? Mm-hmm. Yep. Manouche. Mamanouche. That's like the nuke Lelouch there. Uh, so raw price, $25 to $85. Uh, sold in a five last year between $230 and $460. Too bad he couldn't hit. He was a career 330 batting average. Elected to the Hall of Fame by the Veterans Committee in 1964. This is one of the only cards in the collection that has like a little bit of writing uh, up here in the top corner. Obviously, a little bit off, uh, centering-wise. Also interesting, a couple of the cards I've noticed have this, uh, basically because they're stacked on top of each other for so many years, I'm guessing a little color peel uh, from one card to the next. It's almost like you can see the perfect border of another card and when it's, you know, like the Cronin or something. Very nice, very nice. Uh, all right, next up. Now, all the Hall of Famers are going to be in card savers. As we get further along, uh, they're penny sleeved because we didn't want to do a lot of you know finger touching, but uh, definitely wanted to have them a little bit protected. All right, so here we got Edgar Sam Rice raw price thirty to sixty bucks. Again, not a crazy amount. Graded in a three to four souls for about a hundred to four hundred dollars. So a big swing. Nineteen twenty four World Series champion. Again, he could only hit 322 for an average 2,987 hits. Elected to the Hall of Fame by the Veterans Committee in 1963. Tragedy was in April, on April 21st, 1912, while playing in a minor league ballpark in Illinois, his wife and two small children were in Morocco, Indiana, visiting his parents. A violent tornado struck Morocco, killing his wife, two children, mother, two sisters, and later his father after he succumbed to his injuries. Talk about hard luck. That's basically all before he, like, gets into baseball and, you know, is out there, uh, you know, just racking up the sets. That's got to be tough. Uh, I, this was one of those ones where, you know, we were doing a little bit of research and I was just blown away by a guy that can overcome that kind of devastating loss. Uh, all right, next up, very, very colorful. I don't know how to say this guy's last name, but it reminds me of Beetlejuice. Blugie? Blue Blueage? Blue Blue Let's make it fancy. Come Blue J. And actually, we have two of this gentleman. So we're going to look at both of them. As uh, was common, uh, there are mul- you know, some of these have multiple cards in the same set. Uh, again, we're still in 1933 Gaudi. Uh, so this one is number 113, this one number 159. Uh, both sell raw for anywhere between 10 to $40. Uh, this guy sold uh, in a five between 80 and 100 bucks. Uh, and this guy sold, which is crazy to me, uh, this year, 2021, for $406.55 in a seven. Uh, obviously, this is not a seven. He was on the 1924 World Championship Washington Senators team. Now, you have to go back way before you, to find a Washington Senators team until just recently. I thought it was interesting, too, because we talked about this a couple years back, you know, when the Nationals came in that for a brief time they were kind of both. They were like the Nationals and the Senators roughly at the same time. Yeah. But this, the surprise is they couldn't call them the Senators because the Texas Rangers own the team, own the naming rights for Washington Senators. Because they were the Senators before they moved to Texas. That's what the verifier brings, people. Knowledge! 
All right, next up, I'm going to start scattering the field with these gems. Another twofer right here. We've got Luke Sewell. Obviously, this guy's pretty busted up on that one. Uh, so Luke Sewell here, uh, this is number 114. Yeah, 114, make sure I'm keeping my order correct. Uh, 114, raw price, 15 to 50 bucks, graded in a five sold last year, uh, between one and $200. When I give you the, the in-betweens, that's because multiples are selling uh, throughout the year. Uh, this one, number 163, raw price, 10 to 20 bucks, sold in a four for $84. So again, not a crazy price, but look at that crease. This is like maybe in a bike spoke. I don't know what is going on with this, but still. Now, uh, fun fact about uh, Mr. Sewell, right? He had brothers. Yep. He was one of three brothers who played in the, in the MLB. His brother, Joe, oh. also known as Rip Sewell. Oh, Joe, you said. Joe Sewell. You mean this guy. Yes. Rip Sewell, Hall of Famer. Yankee Hall of Famer. Two-time World Series championship with Cleveland Indians and the 1932 Yankees, a 312 career average Hall of Famer in 1977 by the Veterans Committee, and he's also inducted in the Indians Hall of Fame. Rumor has it he played his entire 13-year career using one bat. At a 40-ounce, he dubbed Black Betsy because it was seasoned with Coke and chewing tobacco juice. That is one of my favorite stories uh, of these cards in the collection. I just, one bat and a 40 ounce, I mean, that's a tree trunk. But one, of course, they're only throwing, you know, 60 to 70 miles an hour most likely. Uh, but still, to have one bat through a 13 plus year career, that's crazy. Uh, also, uh, when he uh, won the uh, World Series with the Yankees in 32, that was Ruth's called shot. Yep. Uh, so he was in that game. Very, very nice. Let's set him. Running out of space here. I don't want to. I don't like to cover guys up, but we're sort of. Well, we got a lot of players. At, at, here. I see. Like I guess we're gonna have over thirty cards here to look at. Uh, okay, so next up we've got Dave Harris. So uh, raw price twelve to twenty bucks, graded in a four to five between fifty and ninety five. Uh, again, a little off center, but really, really nice color still. Uh, you know, got a little, looks like scuffing right here. But other than that, very, very nice card. Next up, Charles Buddy Meyer. This guy's got a lot of uh, history. He was the 1935 AL batting champ. And here's where it gets interesting. He was involved in what's considered baseball's most violent brawl between him and the Yankees' Ben Chapman. Now, if you don't know who Ben Chapman was, if you've seen the movie 42 about Jackie Robinson, Ben Chapman was played by the actor Alan Turdick, and he was the manager of the Philadelphia Phillies, and he was not a nice guy. Chapman used to taunt Jewish players and fans by throwing up Nazi salutes from his position in the outfield. The brawl started with Chapman initially spiking Meyer, kicking off a 20-minute brawl that involved over 300 fans. Each player involved got a five-game suspension and a $100 fine. In 1933, $100 is a lot of money. And the kicker was, Meyer wasn't Jewish. That blew my mind when, when we were reading up on this stuff. Because Meyer, you think, yeah, obviously, Jewish guy. Uh, and it's sort of as deep in the history as I was reading up on it that he wasn't actually Jewish. Uh, and then we were, you know, we were reading up on Chapman and this guy, it was, it was fascinating. Such just a, a horrible human being when you read about, you know, right, you see him in 42 and you read about him. But then later in the history, uh, as I was reading, uh, his son wound up coaching baseball and he coached, you know, multi, uh, multiple teams and guys, you know, black, white, Latino, whatever. And he wound up saying, Chapman, that he was very proud of the way he raised his son and that back in the day, perhaps he went a little overboard in his racism uh, and anti-Semitism, but he felt he was just kind of getting in guys' heads and getting in their kitchen, that he wasn't really maybe as racist as people thought, but uh, 
I don't know. He's not really around to uh, tell the tale. All right, next up we got Eddie Morgan. Uh, raw price, $15 to $45. Graded uh, in a four, sold for $146.94. Uh, again, nice color. The yellow still really, really pops. I like that you can see the Cleveland across the front of the jersey there. The Cleveland whatevers, uh, as we like to call them now. Next up, Monty Weaver. Again, very interesting history on Monty Weaver. He was called the genius mathematician. He was a geometry specialist. Thesis on a train wreck, a train track curve about sports writers always tried to make it into a curveball. He was a rookie sensation with 22 wins for the Senators in 1932. Unfortunately, he was a hypochondriac. Forced him to, he forced, I can't get over this, he forced himself to eat all vegetable diet. Spinach, peas, carrots, made him so gaunt he dropped his weight from 170 to 146 pounds. I'd say that hurt his career. He joined the Air Force after Pearl Harbor was commissioned a second lieutenant and he managed the 8th Air Force baseball team during the war. I love that. Uh, like I said, this guy's crazy history. Uh, just to clarify a little bit on the thesis thing, right? So he got his, I, I believe it was his doctoral thesis, uh, and it was on train track curves, and sports writers would constantly try to get him to admit that it was really about a curveball, uh, but he was always just reading, he's telling them that he they were just reading too much into uh, what he had written his thesis about, but he had a hell of a curveball, and that's why they constantly wanted to talk to him about that. All right, next up here, we got Alvin Crowder. Again, very nice looking card. Uh, raw price, oh, my, my fault here. Uh, the Monty Weaver card, raw, 15 to 40 bucks, sold in a six for $192.50. All right, so Alvin Crowder, raw price, 10 to 40 bucks. Again, raw. These are not crazy, crazy prices. That's why I'm hoping we're going to make an offer uh, to the old fraternity brother who this belongs to uh, and see if we can add them to our collection. Uh, graded, sold in a five for $163.50 and in a six for $171. He was the 1935 World Series championship with the Tigers and a two-time AL wins leader. He was a Yankee killer and his specialty was getting out Babe Ruth. Not a ton of guys can have that in their resume. The Yankee killer. You see that, babe? This guy owned you. All right, next up, we got Willie Cram, or Cam. My bad. That red is just great. Matt, uh, Willie was the master of the hidden ball trick. In 1929, playing for the White Sox, he achieved a triple play using the hidden ball trick against his future team, the Cleveland Indians. He was a dominant defensive third baseman for the White Sox. The team didn't stabilize that position for another 58 years until 1989 when Robin Ventura came along. That has got to be brutal for the fans. <laughs> you got 50 years before you get another third baseman who can hold his own and actually stick around with the team. Wild. Next up, a really beat up Wesley Farrell. Raw price, 10 to 20 bucks. This is, in this condition, probably a $5 card. Uh, graded in a four, sold for $56.55, and in a six, for $205. In 1935, he was the AL wins leader, finished second in the MP MVP voting to Hank Greenberg. He's in both the Indians and the Red Sox Hall of Fame. His brother Rick was a catcher for the Red Sox, Senators, and the Browns. He was in the Hall of Fame by the Veterans Committee in 1984. He pitched a no-hitter April 29, 1931, had four consecutive 20-win seasons, and still holds the record for home runs by a pitcher with 37. Bet you Bumgardner would like to get that. <laughs> this, as I hold this card and I look at it, it makes me feel like, uh, I think it was uh, your uh, our old fraternity brother's grand, his wife's grandfather that owned these cards. He must have, I think, just hated the tribe. Like, this looks like he just crumpled it up in his hand. Like, I hate these guys. All right, next up, Irving Jack Burns. Very interesting looking face on this guy. Like, he's wearing a little blush there. Uh, raw price, 10 to 30 bucks. 
sold in a six for 85 to 100 and in a seven for $225. Try to pick up the pace a tiny bit here. As we, like I said, over 30 cards. All right, so next up we got Willis Hudlin. We don't hear a lot of guys named Willis anymore. Uh, raw price, 10 to 25, graded in a five, sold for about 90 bucks in a seven. For two hundred and sixty-two dollars. You're talking about Willis. I think a lot. There are a number of Cleveland Indian cards in here. Uh, so I don't know if that. I you know I can't help but wonder as you're getting the gum if that's just you know like as people who watch card collecting shenanigans know you get into a streak where you're ripping stuff and you just keep pulling a lot of the same team. Uh, and so I wonder if that was sort of the deal here. Uh, next up, Fred Schulte. So we got raw price twenty to forty dollars. Sold in a five between ninety and a hundred and twenty dollars. Really nice condition still. Looks like a little little off top to bottom, but you can tell the back still really really vibrant white. I'd be curious uh, for the folks watching at home if anybody has thoughts on like what these would grade for. Or at least you know maybe maybe leave a comment if you pick one card and say, oh, I think that probably grades you know as this uh particularly the ruth which we'll show again at the very end we'll close it out because obviously that's what we're here for is babe ruth uh next up earl whitehill now earl whitehill this card here sold raw between 12 and 30 bucks again a steal graded sold in a six for 124 dollars and 25 cents he had 218 career wins he often in the top 10 for hitting batters in 1923, he knocked out Lou Gehrig, unconscious during that streak. Lou regained consciousness and finished the game. There was no concussion protocol then. Shake it off and get back out there. I mean, can you imagine that? You're, you're Lou Gehrig, you're the iron horse, you got the streak going. Dude beans you in the noggin, knocks you out cold. You come to and they say, get back out there. No, no tent for you. You don't go in the concussion protocol. Next up, Jack Russell. I wonder if anyone called him the Terrier. Uh, so we have two Jack Russell cards, so let's make a little room here, and we'll show off both. There we go. Can't do that. Again, crumpled, numbered two. I wonder, maybe he had multiples. Again, look at the red on the back there. Uh, so Jack Russell, both of these cards raw sell for uh, about 6 to $25, give or take. Uh, this one, number 123, sold in a 7 for $251, and this one sold in a 5 for $135. When they're this old, you buy them, right? If you can get them for that price, you just you buy. All uh, right, what do we got here? Next up, we got Max Bishop. After his playing career, Max became the head coach at the U.S. Naval Academy from 1938 to 1962. The Naval Academy Stadium is named in his honor. That is a hell of a long coaching career at one location. Nowadays, you know, if he's a college football coach, he's bouncing around all over the place. Very nice. I like the yellow. Still really pops, even yeah. though they had dinged up corner there. And this is a 33 card, so it wasn't too much after this that he was out of baseball coaching the Naval Academy. Next up, we got Lou Fonseca. I really like, as we, you know, we've been going through these cards, very few of them show any part of the field or the stadium. So this one just jumps out at me because I like to see home plate. He's in the batter's box. Pretty neat. Raw price, 9 to 25 uh, graded in a three, it sold for thirty-seven bucks, and in a five for eighty-nine dollars and ninety cents. Lou is the nineteen twenty-nine AL batting champ with a mere three sixty-nine batting average. He was a career three sixteen hitter. He dubbed himself the father of film study, one of the first ever to use film and film footage to study his playing flaws. Started when he managed the White Sox in the thirties. From 49 to 63, he directed and edited World Series highlight films. He also narrated many. Bob Costas is a big fan, and some of his films are available on YouTube. I don't know if he dubbed himself the father of film study. I actually wrote that down as I dubbed him that. Uh, because I just thought that was fascinating, right? This is the first guy ever. You're talking about the 1930s, 40s. He's out there with, I don't know, what, Super 8 or like 16 millimeter, whatever you're shooting on. 
uh, and filming and then going back. You got to get it developed. You got to go through the processing, and then you got to sit down with a player and you say, "Okay, here's where your 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 you know your batting is off." All right. Next up, Harold Schumacher, 1933 World Series champ with the New York Giants, won 23 games in 1934. Raw price, 15 to 25 bucks. Sold in a four last year for $129. Not bad. A little dinged up. Still good condition, though. This is going to look amazing when it's all done. Just a sea of 30 Gaudis. Next up, we got Fred Marbury. Among the most dinged up in here in, in terms of, like, peel. I wonder if some of these with the red in the back is because of this particular card. 1924 World Series champion with the Senators. First player to record 100 saves retroactively since they didn't count saves before 1969. Raw price 18 to 30 bucks sold in a five for $130. Pretty nice. Pretty nice. Pretty, pretty, pretty nice. All right, so now we're getting into the 1934 Gaudi, famous for its Lou Gehrig says. We got Oscar Melillo. Uh, so I'm going to guess... Melillo? I don't know if any of the L's are silent. Uh, Poor Oscar. He suffered from zoophobia. A generic term for a fear of certain animals like rabbits, birds, snakes. Obviously, he made him prime target for practical jokes by teammates and opposing players. Now, Jay Johnson would have loved a ribbon on this guy. I can just see him hot-footing this guy. Throwing rubber snakes at him and... Doing all sorts of things. Poor guy. I'm sure that's just years of getting pounded on by his teammates. <laughs> Again, uh, really, really great color. And if you can look at this one, actually, some of these corners still pretty, like this guy right here. I just, it's still, if you can still have a sharp corner after all this time. Next up, Frank Don Hurst. He's the only player from, he only played from 1928 to 1934. He was the National League RBI leader in 1932, and he died of, at 47 of cancer. You got to figure a lot of people back then dying of cancer in their 40s, and you know we think it's young today, super young today. But back then, I wonder maybe it's not that young to a lot of these guys. And he was probably smoking, chewing right, chewing tobacco, tobacco and... just going nuts. And they're going, oh, I don't know how yeah, I got yeah. cancer. Well, that's probably all that bad stuff you're ingesting. Uh, so this one, raw price. Uh, 12 to 30 bucks sold in a five, a five for only $45. Very clean. Nice back, well-centered beauty. Next up, Tom Bridges. Tommy Bridges was a two-time World Series champion with the Tigers in 1935 and 45. Six-time All-Star. Won 20 games three consecutive years. In a 1935 national poll, he was voted the number two sports hero of the year behind Andy Penny, a two-sport football and baseball star who led Notre Dame to a come-from-behind win against Ohio State, considered at the time the game of the century. I was fascinated by that story uh, when I was reading up on this and as we were prepping, because, you know, I... I never heard of this guy, and in his era, he's the number two, like, most admired athlete in the nation, and of course, and the fact that the number one is a college football player, is it's not like he's Newt Rockney or something. Very nice card. Getting close to the end here. Next up, Gerald Walker. Gerald was a World Series champ of the 1935 Tigers. He hit over 300 in five of his first seven seasons. <laughs> Nicknamed the Madman from Mississippi due to his being very overly zealous on the base path, often getting picked off. He hit for the cycle on opening day 1937 in a very unnatural way. He hit it backwards. Home run, triple, double, single. I don't know if anyone in like recent memory has done that or... Uh... What do they call it? The unnatural, unnatural cycle. cycle. Wild. When I when I was hearing about the being overzealous on the base paths, it kind of reminds me of Fernando Tatis Jr. Who well, I don't know if I'd call him overzealous, but he overslides second when he steals all the time because he's like it's almost like he's so fast he doesn't realize how fast he's going and he just overslides the base. 
All right, next up, nice catch here, Earl Grace. Oh, that uh, that Gerald Walker sold uh, raw nine to twenty five, and in a five for thirty six bucks. Earl Grace, a uh, raw price fifteen to twenty bucks. Now this is where sometimes it gets a little wild with grading. Uh, so sold in a three for twenty bucks. Sold in a seven. This year on the seventh of January, for three hundred and forty dollars. But then. Last year, November, sold in an 8 for only $315. So like you hear me say all the time, especially as we're kind of in a period where a lot of people are grading a ton of cards, I still maintain my position. These things are only worth what someone is willing to pay you for them. All right, last two. Got Roger Kramer. The Doc, as he was called was a five-time All-Star and the 1945 World Series champ with the Tigers. Played for 20 years, hit 296 for his career, had 2,705 hits, are the most of any player retired prior to the 1975. He was not in the Hall of Fame. He worked as a carpenter before and after his career. He had a boulevard and a youth baseball tournament named after him in his hometown in New Jersey. You know, as you say that, it makes me think, you know, even in the era of, like, Yogi Berra, which is not too long after, where didn't Yogi used to deliver milk? He delivered milk, he delivered all sorts, they all had off-season. Off-season jobs, like, I'm sorry, I don't make $30 million a year like Mike Trout. All right, last card, the only 1935 Gaudi in the lot. Uh, This one, uh, a four-in-one is what they call it. Now, Earl Averill. Uh, this guy right here, he is uh, a six-time All-Star, right? Yep. For the Cleveland, he's in the Cleveland Indians Hall of Fame, and his number three was retired by the team. So if you see a, a Cleveland game on television, if you look up, you'll see the different numbers of retired players. There's Averill's and Hank Greenberg and all the rest of the guys. Now, these are always fun. I wish that he had a few more of these these foreign ones because they're just neat cards. Um just again, a really nice card. The only I'm a little surprised is the only 35 Gaudi sold uh, raw 13 to 26 bucks, and then sold graded in a three for only 28 dollars. So let's wrap it up here. Let's put the babe back in the center position because obviously it's the one to to really get a good look at. I mean, anytime you can hold one of these in your hand, it's special. Uh, you know. I don't even care. Like if I, when I try to buy this, you know, I don't care that it's off center. It's a Babe Ruth card. We don't have any actual Babe Ruth cards in the PC in the vault. Just a beauty. Even with this, like I don't know, that probably is like stuck in a binder of some, you know, some photo album. I'm trying to think here. So this is 33 Gowdy. When he come over to the Yankees in what 20? Yeah, uh, was it 27, 20, 25, 20, 25, something like that. But this is uh, this particular card is among the most common uh, of the Ruth cards in this set. Uh, like I said, it's it got a pop count of almost a thousand graded versions. Uh, only one in the world graded in a one, uh, and then a hundred or uh, yeah, graded in a ten. Only one in the world graded in a ten. A hundred and eighty-one of them graded in a three, and a hundred and ninety-nine of them graded a one. Uh, I don't know if I would call this a ten thousand dollar Babe Ruth card, uh, but who, uh, someone out there might be somebody, willing. There's one out there who'll do it. There's somebody who'll do it. Especially after the guy that you know, the quote unquote actor who I've never heard of, who paid over five million dollars for the Mickey Mantle rookie card. Uh, so there you go, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the great Gaudi reveal featuring the Verifier. Please do leave a comment and let me know what you thought. Uh, you know, we love to read the comments. Slam that like button, make sure you're subscribed to all your friends, and I'll see you next time in the broadcast booth. Say goodbye, Verifier. Bye, Verifier. Oh, that's me. That is you. Oh. Take it easy, everybody.